I think digital learning is a fascinating subject because, um, you know, I think we're really on the verge of some very big changes in the way we uh, educate students. Um, in 2006, someone wrote a column in the Wall Street Journal that said that the last great innovation that made it into an American public school classroom was the introduction of the chalkboard, which was invented in 1803 during the administration of a president known as Thomas Jefferson. Okay? And in 2006, I looked at the Wall Street Journal and I said, no, that's not right. That's not right. And I kind of sat there and thought about it and thought about it and thought about it. And then I said, yeah, you know what? It, it kind of is right. You know, and it's, you know, magic marker board doesn't quite count as a great innovation, right? So I, I'm happy to say to here, just six years later, I'm very confident to say that is no longer true, that there are big things afoot. And if you think about the, you know, education from back to Socrates, at least, and probably further than that, the basic premise of our education system, whether K-12 or higher education, either one, is that we have a scarcity of knowledge, so we're going to train specialists to go and sit in the same place as students and impart that very scarce knowledge. Okay? That's how it's always worked, right? Now, somewhere along the way in the Middle Ages, somebody invents a printing press, and that kind of helps because we get away from handwritten books and scrolls. Okay? Mm, okay, there's a chalkboard, but like just like a, a blink of an eye ago, knowledge became hyper abundant and very cheap to access. Okay? And we are only in the very early stages of figuring out what that means for our education system. But it's mostly very exciting. So I'm going to introduce my, our panel here. I think we've got the, um, an interesting um, variety of perspectives. Uh, Representative Friesen is a um, lawmaker from Florida. So he's been in the trenches on the public policy side of things um, and will share his perspective with us. Laura Howard is coming to us as a practitioner, and this is very interesting to me, but of course because, you know, the classroom is where the rubber hits the road, right? How are we changing in the classroom, and how is it benefiting our students? And finally, John Bailey is a member of our team and a national expert on digital learning, and I am going to turn it over to Representative Friesen first. Thank you very much, Matthew, and I'll just uh, go ahead and do it from here. It's a little bit more comfortable and easier to engage in this conversation. Um, as you mentioned, my, my name is Representative Eric Fressen from Florida um, in Miami, and, and as you've been hearing, obviously, for the last couple of hours from not only former Go uh, Governor Bush, but Patricia Levesque and others, um, it's the, it's, you know, what's happened in Florida over the last 10 years that, um, that, that has kind of focused a lot of the conversation here and how we can kind of translate that cooperatively with perhaps what um, South Carolina is doing or can do and that sort of thing. And specifically on this panel, we're talking about um, kind of digital learning and what, and what the future of that is. And, um, and, and, and uh, interestingly enough, and I was just telling John, this week um, we set up in Florida what we call the Digital um, Task Force, the Digital Learning Task Force 2.0. And the 2.0 thing is, is pretty relevant because for the last year and a half, and I chaired the Education Policy Committee in, um, in the Florida House, for the last um, year and a half I've been starting um, to, to, to really bang the drums on what it is that we need to do in Florida next. You see, kind of all, all of this education reform really has um, an evolution to it. And I think part of what we heard from the beginning earlier on today, particularly with um, where Florida kind of um, pivoted and turned in 98, 99, 2000, and kind of instituted some reforms that led to a lot of the progress we've made up to this point, most of that was focused on are we teaching? Are we learning? How do we know? Are we measuring? Are we holding accountable? So a lot of the first kind of 1.0 versions of the reforms that Florida put in place, um, a lot of which we've talked about today that, that South Carolina is now on the cusp of, of implementing from a policy standpoint, was really just, um, it, it, it was mostly just impacting what was it currently happening in the classroom, meaning um, we weren't sure whether or not, uh, well, we did know that, that 
that we weren't performing to the level that we should, but there wasn't any kind of a system set up, any kind of policy set up, any kind of transparency, accountability, and, and more important, measurement set up so that we know what we're teaching, is it working, if it's not, what, what system do we have to have in place in order to ensure that kids are being taught what they need to be taught, when they need to be um, taught it, and that we have the, 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 the data to let us know that, that, that we're doing that. That's a huge step forward from a reform standpoint from what conventional education was prior to that. So that's what we were talking about earlier today about that probably the low hanging fruit, the simplest reform to put in is just completely changing the way that we look at schools, measure schools, those outputs. So the grading system A, B, C, D, and F is an immediate injection of reform into the public school system because it automatically puts everybody on, on, um, on a different path as far as transparency, what schools are actually doing and what the accountability for that is. Now this, the 2.0 version is this. Now that we have, at least in Florida, the system set up where we at least are measuring what is happening in the classrooms. We have a, um, a as, far, uh, as transparent a system as possible as far as what par the information parents have as far as how their schools are doing, information that the kids and the stakeholders have as far as what schools are teaching, how they're teaching, and where, where students are at in Florida. The next step is how are we teaching that? And that's where we come into this whole digital revolution. Um, and, I, and I think that becomes the next transformative step in, in, in the education reform movement, in, in certainly in Florida and certainly across the US. Now, the exciting part about that is, is that unlike um, 1.0 reform, which is, what you're, which is a, lo a lot of which are the elements that, that we're looking to, to perhaps implement in South Carolina regarding um, grading schools and that sort of thing, this 2.0 can happen at the same time concurrently with 1.0, and it's because of this. You don't need to have 1.0 implemented in order to do 2.0. 2.0 is a very simple thing, and it's this. It is, there is a world around the education system, and, we, and Matthew was just talking about the chalkboard, that is already out there. I have twin boys that are six years old. Those kids can grab this iPad and find information quicker and more accurately and more efficiently than any adult can in the, at, at this point right now. And if we're not embracing that as an education system and recognizing that it's not that we have to have these two of learning, which is conventional learning and digital. But the fact of the matter is that learning period, whether we want to acknowledge it or not for kids nowadays, is digital. So how are we going to incorporate that into the classroom? Now, the best way to do that, um, and this is going to be the next um, stage of reform in Florida is to fully incorporate it into the classroom. And the only impediments that I see, now we can talk about all you know specific things of which curriculums work and which ones don't. But from a policymaker standpoint, and similar to what we've been talking about all day, the same two elements are necessary in order to incorporate these reforms. The first one is simply, although difficult to attain sometimes, political courage. That's it. It's simply a matter of looking at a system that the way that it's being financed today no longer makes sense within the world of how information is delivered, how kids are learning, and more importantly, how even those teachers that know better want to be, able, want to be providing this content. Teachers more than anybody, my wife is a teacher, knows that the system that is created around them and the way in which their classroom is set up by those above them is restrictive to the way that they want to be teaching these kids because they know better than anybody how these kids want to learn. Except the system just hasn't adjusted to allowing that teacher and that school to have that flexibility to be able to do that. So the best way to do it, and, and in this sense, Florida funds education no differently than South Carolina and most of the states in, in the US, which is this. We have funding mechanisms in Florida. We call it the FEFP. In South Carolina, it probably has a different name. Um, but at the end of the day, we fund systems. We fund school districts. That's the way that states fund. I think a large part, and I'm very familiar in the reform movement with, um, with charter schools and, and all the choice um, schools that we've seen be able to kind of um, excel in innovation and in, and in technology in the classroom. And by the way, they're doing it on 60, 65 cents on the dollar. One of the main reasons why they're able to do that, and we talk about the kind of the flexibility afforded to them a lot of times, but it's not so much legal flexibility that they have, but realistically, if you think about it, it's the way that they're funded.
Most of these schools are funded directly to the school, whereas the money that's supposed to follow the child, when we talk about money following the child in the conventional public school system, it's money that is funded by the state that goes to a school district. So when people always, when people constantly ask me, so how much does Florida spend per student? Or how much does Miami-Dade County, which is the county that I represent in Miami, in Florida, spend per student? I would say, well, there's the number that we say at the state level that gets spent per student, then there is the money that we allocate to our school district that the school district says they receive per student. And then there is that actual dollar that nobody knows the amount of that actually follows that child to every classroom depending on where that school is. And that's where the flaw is because I will tell you this, the reason why you see certain schools and certain classrooms that have smart boards and certain schools and certain classrooms that don't is because that principal, that school has, abs has very little control over the actual budget of their school. So they really have very little control of, outside of the confines of what that district or what that state has set up in policies that are never at the speed of where technology is of how you're going to allocate those funds. So part of the reason why you start wondering, well, what, what, you know, what's the magic component in, in how a certain school, um, especially if, if funded on its own, whether it's a private school or a charter school, what have you, um, how is it that with that much less money, there's a smart board in every classroom? And how is it that with that much less money, they're doing more innovative stuff? And I really think a lot of that has to do with letting go of the reins, letting go of control from a top-down, centralized level, and really allowing schools to be innovative. We, we always, when I first joined the legislature as a staffer back in the late 90s and now as a, as a policymaker, and still in all, anywhere I go in the country, we always talk about, well, individual school districts are laboratories for reform, right? So it really shouldn't happen. I mean, states are laboratories for reforms. It shouldn't happen from the federal government. And then in state conversations, state lawmakers always say the school districts are laboratory for reforms. And nobody ever talks about individual schools being the laboratory. So I always say in Florida, we have 67 school districts. I always say we don't have 67 laboratories. We have a thousand if we would just unleash them and let every school be a laboratory. Um, so I, I, uh, you're going to hear a lot more of the technical um, uh, revolutions that are happening and as far as delivery of educational tools from John and from others that know about the specific tools better than I do. But I'm here really to give you a policymaker perspective. And I think what has to happen for all of you that are, that are driving policy, that are stakeholders in policy, and that want to advise your state lawmakers as to how they can best that every single child in South Carolina is unleashed to that, to that technological revolution that is happening. By the way, it happens as soon as they leave that classroom. So they're, they're, they're already, every child in South Carolina is in that technological revolution, some with less access or more access than others, but that's the way they're learning. That's the way that they're processing information in this digital world, period, whether our schools want to acknowledge it or not. So from a policymaker perspective, the best thing that we can do is twofold. One, have the political courage to completely turn the funding system on its head and say we are funding systems as opposed to funding children and funding classrooms. That's the first thing. And I know it sounds simple enough, but ask anybody in your state legislature how long the current funding formula has been around. In Florida, it's been around for 50 years. So while the classroom back then was very conventional and everybody went to class from 8 to 2, and it was that classroom of you know, how many ever kids were in there, while the entire world has changed around them, the way that the kids learn has changed around them, the way that teachers want to teach has changed around them, the funding formula, for the most part, has stayed exactly the same. So even though it sounds simple enough, it takes a huge amount of institutional and political courage in order to be able to change that. But it's vital. I, everything you're going to hear up here today as far as how kids can learn digitally, how we can get digital education in the classroom and everything else, will not happen if you don't allow those precious few resources that we have in dollars, and by the way, we really don't need more. It's just allowing those dollars to be properly spent. That won't happen unless we fundamentally change that paradigm. And the second one is to make it st what, what Governor Bush was talking about, student-centered. You also have to make the funding student-centered. And the best way to do that is to truly allow the independence of the individual schoolhouse, whether it's blended, whether it's full virtual, whether it's you know, a combination thereof, to be its own financing, um, to be accountable for its own finances. And, and the only way that you do that is to essentially make the role of school districts, 
they're still necessary from a management standpoint and from just a keeping order standpoint, but they should not be the determinants of individual funding at a school. You should literally allow as much of that per student funding that is actually funded to go directly to that school unit and allow the leaders in that school to determine how they want to um, allocate their funds. And two things are going to happen with that. One, you're going to unleash an enormous amount of energy from, from that principal, from the teachers inside that school, because they have that much more control over the fate of what happens in their school. And the second thing you're going to see is different schools doing different things, each one being an innovative laboratory, for lack of a better term, of, uh, of educational delivery. And then you will truly have a, an array, a menu um, of, of different kind of innovative approaches to, to, to learning and to teaching that then will be able to more easily be replicated into best practices that everybody can do because nobody is nobody's restricted from a funding standpoint anymore. And two things are going to happen as a result of that. One, I guarantee you that the results will increase for the same reason that the moment that you started grading schools and having transparency and having accountability on site increased. And the second thing that's going to happen is that the moment that you allow a school to take control of its, fund, of, its, of its finances and how it is that they're going to be able to deliver education, you don't need a law to say you shall implement digital. They will do it. <laughs> it's it's, it's going to, you don't, I, I can tell anybody, I can pass a mandate of law saying you must teach digitally, but if we don't change the manner in which they, well, you don't need a lawmaker to tell you to teach digitally. Kids want to learn digitally. Teachers want to teach digitally. They want to incorporate blended models, whether it's full-time virtual, whether it's a combination, whether it's online courses. But you have to let go of those um, antiquated barriers, such as district lines. And funding is going to follow a child, but to the district. And if that child happens to want to live in Miami-Dade County but take a virtual class, even in that same school, from this amazing nuclear physicist teacher from Broward, right now you can't do that. It's another county, sorry. I forgot where I am. Um, right now you can't do that because then Broward says, no, wait a second, I got the FTE for that student, or you got the FTE for that student and I can't do it. So you're not funding based on output. You're, ba you're funding based on an input called an old system. Um, so I, I mean, I'll, I'll be available for questions, but my, my role here was just to tell you, was, or was at least to share the perspective of where, what I'm certainly going to be doing as a policymaker in Florida in the next, in the next term. And believe me, it's going to take, I'm going to have a lot of pushback on this thing, ladies and gentlemen. Trust me, because I'm going to have systematic pushback from school districts that are just used to receiving funds the way that they, that they have been forever. I'm going to have systematic pushback from um, outside um, forces such as textbook publishers and everybody that kind of likes the way that the funding formula works and all the policies that are attached to that. I'm going to have a lot of pushback on this, very similar to 1.0. But those two reforms, if put in place, and most of them are paradigm shifts, once you do that, everything you're going to hear from here will happen organically. So thank you, Matthew, for the opportunity to, um, to be here. Okay. Need to remind everyone that we're still taking questions. And if your table has run out of these things, then the uh, Senator DeMint's staff actually has more. So if you want to ask questions, go ahead and send them up. Great. So next, uh, we have Ms. Howard. So. Uh, I failed to, inter uh, to introduce her very well, but uh, she is not only uh, was the Charter School Teacher of the Year here in South Carolina, she's also teaching in sort of one of these schools of the future, right? Um, so, you know, one of these different model type schools. So I'm very interested to see what you have to say. Thank you very much. Um, thank you all for having me this afternoon. I've got to tell you, I have got the best job in the entire world. Um, it's, 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 I thought when I taught in brick and mortar that I had the best job in the entire world, but I didn't realize when I moved virtual that my entire role as a teacher changed. Um, it moved from me being a transporter of information from my phenomenally grand brain into the somewhat maybe future grand brains in front of me, right, to um, a facilitator and a life changer and a life coach for young adults you know, that's really what they are. For me, I'm high school biology, moving toward the future that they desire for themselves. Rather than me framing it within a square building, within a square schedule, in a square amount of time, um, their lives 
the word that you use is or organic. What they're interested in and what they're doing in their free time, they're able to incorporate into their overall learning persona and into the total person and package that they're becoming. Um, if, if you'll give me a chance um, to play a game here with you. People a lot of times say, well, I cannot possibly imagine how you really have a relationship with these kids when they're on a computer, all right? So I'm going to push an imaginary button here in a second, and y'all need to put your, you know, let's say third grade mentalities in place so you'll be excited about this activity, right? <laughs> it's easy for him. Um, and what I want to do when I press my imaginary button, a black tube is going to fall around you so that you can't see anyone else in the room. The only thing that you can see in the front of that black tube is my shining face. You ready? You got to use your mental power. So here goes the button. Are you in a black tube? All right, so here's the cool thing. You are now all, now they don't live in black tubes, but you're all in your individual home environment. So I'm talking to 100, 100 150 of you guys. And what's cool is you guys see my face. So right now I can look at you and you outside of your black tubes. But right now, every one of you in your black tubes, I'm looking at you in your eyes, talking to you as a person. If you have a question for me, you don't have to wait for me to see your hand raised. You can type it immediately. And I can see Sarah's question, and I can say, Sarah, let me answer that for you right now. And I'm looking you in the face. All right? You all have little signs that you can hold up. A green check if you agree, or a red X if you don't agree. I can ask a question immediately. I see if you've got it. I can give you a genetics problem to work through Punnett squares, and you can write up on that screen. I'll take my face down for a second, and you can write it, and immediately, every single one of you that's writing on that board, I can see exactly what you're thinking in real time. And I can say, mm, sorry, Johnny, let me help you on that. You don't quite have it. I can fix it right now. I don't have to wait for a week for you to mess it up on a test. Are y'all getting the picture there? In addition to that, my face goes off the screen. We're done with our real time. You're working on your own, and you're confused. You can call me any time of day. You have my cell phone number. You have my office number. If you can't get me on the phone, you know that there's office hours where you can always access me. And sometimes I might even be in the local community in a library or something to help you with particular projects. So give me a nod of the head. Can y'all see how this can be personalized? Do y'all understand that? And the cool thing, though, is that these kids are not in black tubes. These kids are teen mothers that need help because they don't know what to do with that baby and nobody's really telling them. And so I can coach them on some parenting techniques. Okay? These kids are children who are abused, who are um, in group homes that before had no opportunity to even get close to a college degree because it was just someone filling a space. But now they can work toward Carnegie units and they see somebody that they would never have even met in their experience but they see someone who's happy, who loves life, who sees the value in education and sees the value that they have in them, of themselves and can encourage them on a daily basis. So you can take some of your best and brightest staff who are the most encouraging people, who have the best message for future growth and development into some areas where those kids may not have ever seen that for a pretty bargain package price, okay? On top of that, we're able to provide I think this is key. The role of the teacher, y'all hear me say that, is changing. I facilitate learning. I'm also sort of a little educational doctor, I think. I see what a child comes in with. I can diagnose their needs, and I can prescribe what they need. A large number of our students that come into South Carolina Virtual Charter School with IEPs, Individual Education Plans for Special Needs, are able to drop their IEPs. They're able to drop that label because extended time, some of those things that students need that they don't have in brick and mortar, they've got it. Students can take the time they need and they can be prescribed what they individually process through. Um, if a student, aut my autistic students, I teach biology, high school biology, in my three years with South Carolina Virtual, I have never had an autistic student fail the state end of course exam. That would be, in the positive light, 100% of my students with autism have passed the state EOC. Y'all can clap for that. Isn't that great? You know, these kids love learning. And, and for that particular group, you take away some of those social stigmas that were a block to them, and you let them choose when and how they're going to build on those skills. We don't force it upon them. They're able to figure out what they need and how they need it, and they can grow in that area. And if they're blessed with the opportunity to choose this option, 
That's fantastic. Um, students with religious differences that maybe don't go along our certain calendar, students with different medical needs, a lot of diabetics, um, students with brain tumors, things like that, that in the past, they just had to stop their educational path. And so for me, my job is daily, daily exciting. I'm not just helping the most advanced kids. I'm not just helping the most disadvantaged kids. We're helping everybody. Everybody that desires to move forward. Everybody that desires to come and plug in realizes that they have the opportunity to grow. And I could go on for hours about all the testimonies that these kids have. But it is the best job in the world to teach science, which I love, to kids that I love, and to see one child at a time how we're growing the total economic future of South Carolina forward. And that's the game that we're really in, right? Because the more educated our kids are, the better they're going to be on that economic market, and the more educated their children will be, and so forth. Do you all agree? Do you all agree? Yeah? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Because that's key. That's where we are headed. So um, I can take questions in a little while, but virtual learning is a truly personal experience. I feel more connected personally with my kids than I ever did in a brick and mortar. And y'all can tell I love people, so I felt pretty connected with those. Um, and and it's, it's the opportunity for these kids to get the basic skills and then expand phenomenally forward. They are civically responsible. They are out volunteering. They are out doing incredible things in their community because they have more time to frame themselves as a total person. Thank you. So, John, um, you know, I think one of the uh, interesting comparisons to see, uh, yeah, I know, good luck. <laughs> I'm still stuck as a third grader. In my head, so. <laughs> exactly. I read a comparison recently between uh, the current move to digital education and the Green Revolution, which is underappreciated as one of the great philanthropic triumphs of, of all time. Um, as you know, a group of philanthropists introduced uh, agricultural techniques into third world countries and enormously increased their productivity. Um, in fact, India. You know, when I was a kid, I always got told. Ladner, or Matthew, actually. Matthew, eat your broccoli. There's, there's kids starving in India right now, right? Well, India today is exporting rice, right? Who would ever have thought it's possible? So and if you go and read about the Green Revolution, you'll read a lot of people complaining about how hard it was to get people to do this stuff, right? So why don't you tell us a little bit about how you see the battle unfolding and how fast the progress is? And it is hard to follow <laughs> uh, both of these, these folks. I, especially, I, I think the, the previous perspective is it's just so important because that's the one sort of stigma that digital learning has is that it's not personal. Like on one hand, you hear it's personalized education, and on the other hand, you think it's just kids sort of blindly looking into a computer. And it's so far from that. And it's, it's hard to sort of capture on a stage and in a PowerPoint. You really sort of have to experience it. You really have to experience it. I like the idea of sort of imagining that you're a third grader, experiencing it uh, from, from their perspective, from, from their eyes, because everything, they're growing up in this world that is largely digital. Everything is digital to them uh, right now, uh, especially on cell phones. That's how they engage a lot of this, uh, th this area. Uh, but growing up, there's a great YouTube video recently of a, of a baby that's opening up a Time magazine, and the baby keeps clicking. He thinks it's an iPad. Uh, and the baby can't even speak yet, but the father was taping this because that's, it's just interesting. The kid got so used to tapping around and navigating icons on an iPad that when all of a sudden you give it Time Magazine, it's like it, this, the picture doesn't do anything. Um, so what I want to do is just in a very quick way is talk a little bit about sort of digital learning from a, a policy standpoint. Uh, the good news, let's see, it's one of these buttons. There we go. So uh, the, the good news, I just want to tap a little bit on what was just said about um, the Green Revolution. I just came from a conference last week uh, where there were a ton of new um, uh, education startups, nonprofits, all funded and fueled coming out of Silicon Valley. And I, I think this is really significant because this goes to what Governor Bush was saying this morning, that we were at a precipice in a way of, of really tapping into some unprecedented uh, minds, uh, and talent and new resource tools that can help empower you as educators uh, and as education leaders. What's fascinating is that they're pulling in talent from Google, they're pulling in talent from Amazon.com, all the different technologies and online services that have revolutionized every other era, element of our lives are sort of now being pulled into trying to think about how can we change and improve education. 
Uh, and so you have a lot of passion, you have a lot of investment, and a lot of these new tools and services that are coming to help empower you as educators, you as school leaders, to offer sort of new models uh, of education. I think if you had to boil it down into sort of like three big categories into how this revolution is happening, first, it's personalizing education. Uh, it's this whole notion of, again, you go on Amazon.com and it's personalized to you. It gets to know you and it makes recommendations for you. But we are now in, entering into an environment where uh, you don't have to just teach to the middle of the class. Uh, that through uh, computer-assisted uh, assessments, that it can assess kind of where students are, uh, their strengths and their weaknesses, where their needs are, and then develop customized plans for each one of those students based on what their unique strengths and weaknesses and unique needs are. What's amazing about this is you're seeing it really transform a lot of uh, literacy classrooms in particular, where, again, imagine if you're in a, in a sixth grade, uh, you're a sixth grade reading teacher, and you have kids coming into your class that are second grade reading level. You have some kids that are actually reading above, you know, the grade level, maybe at ninth grade, and then you have a group of kids that are at sixth grade. Well, you're a sixth grade teacher. You don't know how to teach second grade reading. And, and you're sort of forced to teach in this middle, and kids fall further behind, they get more frustrated. But in these new environments, the kids come in, the kids that are second grade reading level get assignments built for them at their specific needs and at their specific level and help sort of scaffold them up to sixth grade. And the teacher is freed up to spend more individual time with them. Uh, the kids that are, can read uh, faster and at higher grade levels are able to move forward. And so as a result, everyone sort of wins in this environment, especially the teacher who gets to spend more personalized one-on-one -on -one time uh, with the kids. And so again, we're seeing technology facilitate that personalization in the way that's transformed a lot of our con consumer behavior, but now helping uh, in education. Expanding access. This is access to a whole variety of things. Uh, AP courses and other courses and content. Uh, if you're in a rural school district and you have one student that wants to take AP calculus, it doesn't make sense for you to hire an AP calculus teacher and travel all the way to your school to teach that one kid. But online, and all of a sudden you can pick from an AP uh, calculus teacher and bring them to your student. You can bring the best teachers to your students, no matter where those teachers are located. You can bring the best course material uh, uh, to that student. W one of the ways I got involved in this is that anyone know the, 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 we're coming up on a, the anniversary of the Titanic? Uh, Robert Ballard, uh, when he found the Titanic, uh, was struck by how many students sent him notes and emails asking, how did you find the Titanic? And so he launched this whole sort of science project and online expedition that helped engage kids in science to help learn, again, different ways of how he used mathematics and calculus to help find the Titanic. The cool thing about it is that once a year he would let students go with him on an internet expedition to explore some sort of sunken treasure somewhere uh, on the earth. And so uh, they, they would give a classroom in a selected area a joystick and then a student would be told, okay, now take the joystick and push it forward and drive the little remote submarine into the hull of the shipwreck. And you see the teachers freak out, right? I mean, they're going to get the bill for breaking the robot and the shipwreck. All of a sudden, the, you know, the, you see the video screen, you see the submarine going closer and closer, and then it just stops. And Robert Ballard, founder the, who found the Titanic, he goes, you want to know why it just stopped? Ask your teacher tomorrow. And what the teacher then gets is a lesson plan, and it's just trigonometry. It's using lasers and a system that sort of forms a force field around the, the submarine. But those kids were totally engaged in the next day. Again, amazing that he can just engage kids like that and bring those sort of content and resources and new experiences to students, no matter where they're located. And then enabling new models of, uh, of education. This is, again, you, you, it's not just purely about delivering courses online, and it's not just about purely delivering courses in a traditional-based way. Uh, in much the same way that we have never replaced all of our shopping habits just purely by going to Amazon.com, we now shop at stores, we now shop online and then go to stores. I think you're going to find the, the greatest impact of this digital revolution is going to be in transforming what happens in the classroom with new blended learning environments, taking the best of online learning, the best of digital learning, and transforming the class around those new flexibilities and around uh, some of those new opportunities too. One of these. Wait, is the bottom one? It's the only thing that has improved is the, there you go. So creating a digital learning environment, and this is the key thing, especially as policymakers in the room, it's not just one thing that you do. It's not just creating one state online school. It's not just authorizing three virtual charter schools. It's about creating an environment that allows digital learning to be explored in a whole bunch of different ways. 
And one of the things that Governor Bush's foundation has done is looked at each state's policy environment along 72 you know, very discrete elements to see how friendly our state policy environments to this type of, of online learning. That is all available on a website. It's called Digital Learning Now. You get state-by-state -state report cards so you can see how South Carolina is doing against other states. You get roadmaps to reform in terms of very uh, uh, um, uh, precise actions that you could take as policymakers and also school leaders. Toolkits to help with advocacy and also videos and examples. Again, trying to picture this through a PowerPoint, very difficult. Video examples uh, is, is a little bit easier. So there are seven crucial elements that if you had to boil it down out of those 72, what are the seven most critical ones uh, that I just want to take a, a, a quick stab at, at, at talking about? One is first establishing a competency-based education system. You've heard this mentioned throughout the day, but this whole notion of moving from just uh, supporting students' uh, seats, seat time, for 180 days to letting them learn the material at their own pace. And if they can master the material faster, let them test out of it and then move on to the next level. But support competency-based learning rather than seat time, uh, seat time learning. Providing a robust offering of high quality courses from multiple providers. This gets back to the previous uh, uh, panel, but we are moving into an era of school choice where it's not about schools, but you can get to choice down to discrete course levels. And that's great because some students are going to learn calculus really well in class and others are going to learn it really well online and others are going to re uh, learn it even better in a sort of a blended environment. But you want uh, the system moving to this high quality courses rather than just thinking about you know, sort of purely systems and purely entities. Ending the archaic practice of seat time, again this is the whole notion of we fund uh, education based on seat time, we award students based on how long they stay in school, not based on if they've mastered the content. So again, sort of upending the system, focusing on mastery of content rather than just how long a student is in a particular seat in a particular classroom. Funding education based on the achievement instead of attendance. Again, this is just how the system sort of has the incentives misaligned, but we have fund not based on if a student is actually learning the material and completing a course, but based on if they've completed the school year. We need to move, again, to focusing on mastery and that the student really master the content. Uh, funding the student instead of the system. Again, I think we heard that on this panel, but just this is so, so important, but the notion of making sure that that student has the chance to take uh, the funding that they're receiving from all different levels of government to the different providers of their choice uh, in order to receive the education that best meets their needs. That's again going to be most often the school district and the schools within a district, but you're going to have a lot of other uh, online opportunities through other providers and through again these sort of blended experiences. Eliminate the practice of school districts of prohibiting uh, students from enrolling with approved providers. Uh, again, this gets to the notion of we fund systems, and if you fund systems, systems have an incentive to keep students within the system, not to do necessarily what's always in the best interest of the student. And so this is, again, empowering them and their parents uh, and their teachers in many cases, too, with the option of, again, if that student wants to take a course online, and that online course provider has been approved by the state or some other sort of um, authorizer entity, uh, then that student should have that flexibility and should have that option. Uh, and then breaking down the barriers such as uh, all these other sort of regulatory environments, uh, the vast majority of our public policy, regulations, legislation, uh, and, and so forth, never imagined a day where a student in South Carolina could go to school uh, in South Carolina and then at night be taught by a teacher uh, from Ohio or from Florida. Uh, the most policy just never conceived that, and so you have all these sort of archaic regulations around that in terms of uh, uh, teacher-student uh, ratios, class size limits, uh, you have notions of caps in terms of how many students can enter into an online course, and so as a result, you, you end up uh, inhibiting students having access to these different opportunities. So it's thinking about creating flexibility there to allow for some of these new models. Now, there's uh, more that you can find on Digital Learning Now, including South Carolina's uh, report card. The great news is that you're doing very well as a state. You have a lot to be proud of. You have a state virtual school that is really uh, offering a lot of great opportunities for students, including AP courses and other, uh, uh, other options for students. You have a number of virtual schools um, that, are f that are done through charter schools. Uh, and as well as a number of districts that are offering blended learning environments. If there are a couple areas where South Carolina can improve on, it's that last point that we just talked about, which is creating that environment uh, for more providers and for more experimentation to happen with digital education. And so to learn more about how to do those things, I would just direct you to the Digital Learning Now website. You can follow uh, Digital Learning Now on Twitter and also on Facebook. And again, the, the whole purpose of this initiative is designed to help support you in your efforts in figuring out what is the South Carolina model 
uh, for offering a, a transformed education for students uh, that harnesses the power and, and opportunity of digital education. Great. Um, to me, the most important thing to understand about digital learning is, uh, you know, one of the questions that actually came up we didn't get to from the last session was, what do you do about this perception that this is going to damage the current system by allowing kids to go somewhere else and, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, the most important thing to understand about digital learning is the fact that it is going to allow high-quality teachers like Ms. Howard to reach more students in a way that never would have been possible before, right? That is what the future is going to look like. Um, first question, what is a flipped classroom, and do you think that school districts can use it to improve academic outcomes? So uh, w one of the challenges in this area of digital learning is that we come up, the, the only thing that happens faster in the technology is the use of new terms uh, and coming up with new terms. And so the idea of a flipped classroom is how you use classroom time. That if you go into a classroom now, often what happens is, let's say it's a 40 minute instructional period, you know, there's 20 minutes of a teacher doing a lecture or some sort of form of conveying sort of the material for the class. There might be a couple of minutes, a small group discussion, and maybe some back and forth interaction with the teacher, and then the students go home and do homework. Uh, the notion of a flipped classroom is that, particularly now with the, the, this rich sort of robust resources we have with new videos and new tutorials and new demonstrations, that you can assign students homework that actually helps them learn the material at home for homework, and then when they come into the classroom, the classroom time is spent for more 101 instruction and for more classroom discussion. So the interaction is happening uh, in the classroom during that class period of time, whereas the learning the material is happening uh, with the student uh, at home through some sort of computer. So uh, the Khan Academy is a great example of this. If any of you have seen that, he's been on 60 Minutes and featured you know, uh, on a variety of news channels lately. But you know, he's, de he's developed all these like thousands of different math and science tutorials. And so students can take that or can take other videos, learn the material, and then they're prepared for the classroom discussion the next day. It's flipping the model. Yeah, we, we have a school in Arizona, uh, it's in, out in Yuma, that is basically completely based on this. And uh, the students, when you walk in the door, there are 240 students working in a computer lab. But every 50 minutes, they rotate some of the students into actual classroom instruction. And a lot of the blocking and tackling of learning is happening on the computer. And a lot of what the teachers are doing is similar to what Ms. Howard described as, as helping work out problems that the students, and they've detected on the software, this school has 240 students, is uh, a grade 6 through 12 school, has one math teacher, one math aide, and it has the biggest math learning gains in the entire state of Arizona. Okay? It's a really incredible school. It's called Carpe Diem. You should Google and learn about it. So we have a question for Laura here. Or what challenges have you had to deal with regarding competition from public schools? Has there been hostility to what you guys are up to? Hello. <laughs> um, not, not so much. I tell you, it's, um, I try to put my best face forward, and we are public school. Uh, South Carolina Richard Charter School is a public school, and I work diligently to maintain positive relationships with my public school friends. Um, I was in brick and mortar for five years before I came virtual, and um, I value what they are doing. And, I mean, I was there with them. It's just a different job. So my greatest um, challenge, I guess, it's it, every person that I know in education wants kids to succeed. You know, I have not yet met a teacher, administrator, anybody that didn't care about kids. Um, it's tackling those, those misunderstandings and, and forming partnerships, building bridges. And so anytime somebody comes with a negative or a misunderstanding, just kindly um, talking them through that because my hope for the better tomorrow is that whatever the system ends up looking like that we're all working together our end product is that kids have the best possible educational experience before them I have a six-year-old I hope by the time he graduates high school that he couldn't have possibly imagined any better educational system to come through so you know in short people are always gonna have challenges I think the challenge becomes what you make of it and I have found every time when I'm positive it's a positive outcome this is a very interesting question. Um, 
you know, the, the Europeans have this critique of American schools, you know, and when Europeans and Americans get together to argue about education policies, we usually point the finger at them and say, you guys track kids from an early age, and you decide in third grade who's going to go to college, and then who's going to trade school, and you know, blah, blah, blah. And the European response is, oh, yeah? <laughs> Just what have you Americans prepared a child to do when he does not go to college? And that's the part where we kind of wince and feel bad, right? The question is, how does this relate to having high schools be more oriented towards the trades and not just the students going to college? What about the other half, as a book once called it? Well, the, the, the first thing is I, I, I never want to, and I, don't, and I don't mean this in a kind of, um, you know, feel good, be politically correct kind of way, but um, have this kind of predetermined notion that there will be the other half. I mean, it, but the, the main problem is that um, our system is so kind of structured, predetermined, and prescribed from a centralized point, no matter how we look at it, whether it's curriculum, textbooks, the delivery of it, even the fact that we talk about it as a system as opposed to just education delivery, the fact that we're talking about it as a system, it makes it automatically obtuse. It makes it inflexible to the desires and needs and, and, and what challenges or what excites a, a certain kid. So what ends up happening oftentimes is that the ch in trying to be prescriptive because of a well-intentioned um, notion, which is every child will receive an education, and it is a well-intentioned notion, it's what does that education look like, what does that child actually seek in an education, and what does that child recognize individually that we can never recognize as a state, as a nebulous concept called a state or a district or something else, which is that child at a certain point pretty much recognizes some strengths that he or she may have. And if we don't have a system, a marketplace of of learning that that child can somehow navigate towards, yes, you want basic competencies to happen from a societal level, but if that child cannot have the access, the immediate access in real time to be able to um, nourish that which he or she knows is the route that he or she wants to take, that which he or she knows interests them. And the only way to do that, quite frankly, you know, 40 years ago it was different. We had to set these, you know, kind of where you, where you, where you see in that yeah, Waiting for Superman movie, which is you had this track over here for trades and this track over here. But here's the thing. Even the concept of trades, that's too general of a statement. There's no such thing as trade. I mean, yes, I mean, we could talk about conventional trades, but the future of the jobs that are out there can't just be easily categorized into this thing called trades or academia. It's just all over the place. And if we allow, here's the thing. We're not waiting for technologies or for a delivery system for these kind of individualized, student-centered learning mo uh, models to take place. They're here. Talk to John. Talk to the vendors. They're, they're out there. These methodologies of, of bringing all sorts of knowledge and information to students are already out there. It is only us um, that participate in the system of education delivery that are, that are creating the barriers for that to come in. So I think the main thing for us to do is forget about the kind of the, the, the high-end academic conversation of whether or not we're, you know, whether we have enough tracks in the U.S. or not. The best way to kind of put all that stuff aside is just if you if you actually manifest that which we're talking about here which is completely revolutionizing the education system make it student centered allow that student to have some say in what he or she wants to learn how they want to learn it at what pace they want to learn it you're going to realize very quickly that everybody's going to excel it may not be this finite point where you say that person is a trade skill that person is an academic but I guarantee you that the end result of that 10 15 years one generation from now my kids by the time they're graduating, the end result of that is going to be a heightened sense of not only um, confidence and certainly output from each one of those students, but they're actually going to do so not having to wander around for 10 years after they get a high school diploma to figure out this is what I want to do or this is what I like or now I see something that actually fits what, what, you know, what my personality, what my knowledge base, what I like to learn and what I like to um, exercise my skill set in. 10 years later, they'll start recognizing that and having abilities to learn about that while they're in the K-12 system. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the, you know, that, that conversation can, can continue to take place, Matthew, but I think if we can actually, from a policy standpoint, implement some of the things we're talking about now, and certainly from a marketplace of not conflictive kind of system, conventional public versus non-public, and get away from those conversations and really talk about this, the child and how we can deliver stuff to the child directly, individually, 
all these conversations, us versus them, uh, trade versus academia, all of those conversations will be things that we used to talk about. They won't be things that we talk about in the future. Right. Yeah, and of course, the, in my view, the thing that would improve trade education more than anything else is improving the basic literacy and numeracy skills right. of our students, yeah, that's right? That's right? That's I mean, that's this doesn't, competencies and yeah, whether you want to go to college or not. Right. All right, we've got, we've got a real techie in the audience, I can tell. It says, what is the place of game-based learning in this push for education and innovation? Do you think it has a future? Game-based? Game-based, yeah. Go ahead. So, uh, game-based, this is one... Um, this is, this is another great example, I think, of where you have a lot of um, minds in Silicon Valley that have, uh, for years, uh, been able to get our kids addicted to Xbox and to other games. Uh, is anyone out there addicted to uh, the Angry Birds, where you find <laughs> yourself playing it just mindlessly and it, you just keep getting addicted? Uh, it, there, there's, it turns out these games are, there's a whole science to it that has had to be created about how do you help uh, teach sort of the different skills you need to uh, play the game and then how do you keep sort of setting these incremental levels where it's just in this like psychological sweet zone of being difficult enough that you're not successful but not too difficult that you want to give up and not too easy that you just you know throw it away completely and so and, th and that gets you into that sort of addictive cycle where you feel like if I just try it one more time like I'm gonna get to it and so gamers have been able to sort of you know, figure this out to a science, and then that creates these sort of blockbuster hits, uh, you know, for the Xbox, for the gaming consoles, for Angry Birds. Uh, on Xbox last year, Call of Duty, uh, before the game even came out, made more money than a Hollywood, blo than Avatar did in global distribution sales. It, it is just amazing kind of what's happening there. And so what now they're trying to bring that into education, which is how do you teach a concept in a gaming-like environment and encourage students to keep progressing at their own pace, again, in that sort of sweet spot, where it's difficult enough that they're not totally successful the first time, but not too difficult where they just give up uh, and they keep trying to keep going further and further. So it's using a gaming approach to the way of conveying um, you know, content, skills, and other sorts of, uh, of areas inside of education. Or how do you see this unfolding in the classroom? Or Yeah, it's interesting. I think um, as a scientist, and it, you know, first before being teacher, um, I'm always watching data trends, and I think it's just a part of my person to to see the data as it flows in. Um, and our kids are data, and the students that struggle the most with the transition to an online environment, I have found, often are my gamers. Um, they have a very difficult time differentiating game from reality. Sometimes um, these kids are in my classroom at 14 and 15 years old and they've been doing video games and stuff since they were three and um, so I think game-based learning has a place but I think that's going to be one of the future challenges on the educational horizon is um, while there's value in engaging a student through play and through you know things there's also a lot of value in going out in the woods with a field guide and identifying that leaf you know just doing real world problem solving um, and and at this point, it's not so hard that I can, you know, I can identify those students and, and we can work with it. But it's a, it's a struggle for them to bring the education to a real-world level when the, the primary way that they have perceived their world is through gaming. Um, yep. from, from a non-kind of, um, you know, specific um, knowledge base of what game, you know, game, the, uh, game knowledge is or game learning is or, or all that. What I can tell you is this, at least from a policy standpoint, that the biggest mistake we could ever make, whether it's game learning or whatever the next concept is going to be out there, is either A, to as policymakers say, we're going to implement game learning, where it may not work for everybody, um, and, and B, or B, not create the environment, whereas those that perhaps are creating these game, um, game learning delivery methods can't know right away whether or not it's either going to A, work or not. And I'll tell you, the best way to do that is not create barriers. And here's what's going to happen. As long as you have an accountability system set up up front in place where the teacher, the student, the parent, everybody's accountable for what the, output, the outcomes of those students are, I'll tell you what the fate of game learning is. If it works, 
it'll be sold and people will buy it and people will implement it. If it doesn't, it's going to go the way of the laser disc. I mean, it's just, it, it really is that simple. But the worst mistake that we can make with that or with any of these other kind of things that are coming out of Silicon Valley is either A, as policymakers, be so enamored by it that, that we're going to put it into statute and say, y you shall utilize this where it may not work for everybody, um, and, be, or, and or B, not create an environment of accountability um, and, and, and self-empowerment um, self at the school site where that teacher or those students don't become the real-time consumers of a product and the determinants of whether or not something works or it doesn't work, whether it has value or whether it doesn't have value. If we can combine those two and stay out of the way, that'll answer the question of whether or not game-based learning works, in my opinion. It's okay. so a very practical question here. It says, um, for virtual classes or, you know, obviously for other types of school models, is there any financial support for those who cannot afford the technology necessary? It's similar to a classroom with scholarships. So obviously kids vary in their access to technology. How is that is issue dealt with? Um, I can speak to that for the South Carolina Public Charter District. All of, um, with the exception of the South Carolina Virtual School Program, which is run through the State Department and provides courses in addition to what students are doing in their regular educational experience. All of the virtual schools in the state are run through the South Carolina Public Charter School District. And um, it is a free public school opportunity for all students. And so when students apply um, based on their free and reduced lunch status, if they qualify for free and reduced lunch, then they are given computers, um, one per child, and they are provided um, internet stipend to, to, to assist with their internet. Okay. Great, well, we're going to get a final word from the superintendent, but let's have a round of applause for our panel. We'd like to wrap it up here, and, and uh, in so doing, I want to acknowledge the contributions uh, of Senator DeMint, who organized this forum or this summit. Uh, I also want to recognize Governor Jeb Bush and his staff who came and the staff of uh, Senator DeMint. They did a great job. The people who've stuck it out to the very bitter end, you guys all have a passion for education and you have a passion for our children. We talk about students and we've had lots of numbers, but at the end of the day, every number and every student is a child with hopes and fears and dreams. And I know all of us can work together educators, legislators, the business community, uh, guys who are elected like me can work together to build a system that more effectively serves every child in their unique needs, their unique aspirations, and their unique hopes. Whether that's a career model, whether that's a four-year degree in liberal arts or sciences, or whether it's a high-paying job in our high-tech manufacturing in South Carolina. At the end, what we will have as our students have more options and more success is a more prosperous state and a safer and better society for all of us. Thank you for coming today and thank you for being a part of this exciting event that I think will be a real platform for change in South Carolina. Thank you very much.